couple of armchair GMs who have yet to be wrong with any of their Timberwolves takes. <laughs> right. It's Flagrant Howls with Phil Mackey and Kyle Tykey. And welcome in to your favorite Timberwolves lifestyle podcast, where we just want the Timberwolves to win 50 regular season games for the first time since 2004. That's, That's right. so crazy. That's so long. It's, <laughs> it's time. Every time you say it, it's so depressing. Well, I mean, I want it to be more of an uplifting. Hey, this is where <laughs> this is where this thing is yeah, headed. That's true. That's true. In two thousand twenty-two, twenty-three. But yeah, like within that context, it's you know, not like fifty games is a tough milestone. But I feel like most teams have reached it in the last eighteen years. In fact, maybe we can go and have the Kings reached it. I don't know if the Kings have reached it, and they're like one of the teams that's had like a well now one of the longest playoff droughts in the NBA. But it is kind of crazy to think that there's 30 NBA teams and 16 make it pr- prior to, you know, the play-in tournament. And, uh, I mean, half the league makes it. Over half the league makes it every year, and the Wolves just tried their darndest over the last two decades to not make the playoffs. You know, I'll bet the Hornets haven't gotten that milestone either, right? Those, that, that, that's just a nondescript, yeah, that might be, you might franchise. Yeah, you might have to do, like, thorough research on that because if they the brought Bobcats. their— Cats. Yeah, the Hornets brought their record from New Orleans back to Charlotte, then maybe, but— yeah, I don't think I don't think the Bobcats ever sniffed fifty oh, wins. Yeah, this is what we can do, like to make ourselves feel better about the last eighteen okay, years. We, we can just kind of trash and clown these other. There's only like three franchises <laughs> we can really do it with. Uh, the you care to guess the last time the Hornets Bobcats combination? Damn. So this is just the Hornets, just the Charlotte teams. Mm-hmm. They're all they're all like one franchise history. Yeah, the last time a Charlotte NBA team won fifty games. 97? 97, 98. Wow, dude. Look at that. Wow. Look at that. Amazing at that. basketball radar right there. Kyle. <laughs> uh, yeah, the 97, 98 team coached by Dave Cowens. And okay. the, the, the top win share player on that team was Glenn Rice with his weird Oh, wow. That's a, that's a throwback. Uh, okay. So, that, okay. so they are technically having a worse time than Minnesota. The last time the Kings won 50 games... Ooh, but that's interesting. Okay, that's got to be that's got to be two thousand four, right? Two thousand four, two thousand five. We're gonna give you okay. Thank you credit for that. Yeah. So they're one year more recently. The Garbage Kings have uh, have won fifty games. That was Rick Adelman's second to last year, and Brad Miller was the top win share player on that Kings team. So oh four oh five would have been the year after the Wolves beat the Kings to go to the Western Conference Finals because that was oh three oh four. And then the next year, those Kings were still pretty good. Um, and then it all fell apart. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there it is. All right. We, uh, the, the Charlotte, garbage, <laughs> bunch of clowns. That's right. Timberwolves hold supremacy over you the last two decades. Um, so uh, let's get into it. You were in the Twin Cities for the Timberwolves annual media day. And uh, you have stockpiled a bunch of thoughts and observations and uh, whatnot. So the floor is yours. Guide us through your uh, your biggest thoughts and observations from Wolves Media Day. I think I think the biggest was that the vibes were just better. Um, again, a year ago when they had Media Day, it was on five days after they fired Gerson Rosas. So, you know, they 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 had Tim Connolly and all his friends in the front office there, and like every the vibes were just much better. Um, Ant had to address some of his stuff a little bit, but other than that, it was a lot of basketball talk, a little. Um, you know, as you may have heard by now, Austin Rivers and I got into a deep dive about his love for Mighty Ducks. Um, what mm. the what the his favorite movie was of those of that trilogy, which he got the answer right. And then um, Connolly and Finch spoke at the top. There was no Carl. I, uh, I think he might still be sick as of today, Thursday. But uh, it's not supposed to be a big deal. I just has something going on. They don't want him around. Well, the team. it's a big deal for the graphics department. that now has to Photoshop him into all of the Dude, Wolves you, team photos and like video board things. Right. Isn't that the biggest pain in the ass? I, and like <laughs> people think people can scoff at that. But when that's your job, like it sucks that they don't have him for like any. They're going to literally have to really do a good job of outlining him and superimposing him next to Rudy. <laughs> Um, but yeah sorry, so, to the, yeah, sorry to the graphics guys and, and gals that have to deal with uh, Kat's yep. absence. <laughs> no, but so the, the vibes were good. And then just, you know, my, my, my biggest takeaway last year was that a lot of guys, not selfishly, but just kind of were focused on, okay, you know, I, I'm in a contract year. I'm going to get another contract, whether it be they were extension eligible or guys like, you know, Torian Prince that were 
still very well going to stay in the league, but they didn't know where their next paycheck was going to come from. But this year, it's a lot of, uh, you know, they lost Pat Bev, they lost Vando. So you lose like that leadership quality and that toughness. And it's like, well, I know you got better because Rudy Gobert is an all-star, but did you lose like that toughness, that kind of grittiness, um, that veteran experience? And hearing guys like Kyle Anderson, Austin Rivers, even Bryn Forbes, Eric Pasco, like they're, they – sent out a lot of depth to make the blockbuster trade of the summer to get Rudy Gobert. And then Tim Connolly went to work, and that's his job, making all that money, is to fill out the back end of that roster, not only with veterans and leaders, but also guys who probably might have to play because the 82-game season is really long, and you're going to have guys miss you know, two weeks for a hamstring, two weeks for this, that. So uh, it, it definitely still is, after you traded away all that depth, it still is the deepest Timberwolves roster of all time. Let's go down this leadership path for a second here, and then okay. I want to. I okay. also want to go back to the the Mighty Ducks discussion because <laughs> I also have a lot of strong takes on uh, on that trilogy. So, let's start with this question for you: What were your what were your leadership power rankings on the Timberwolves roster last year, and what does that power ranking look like now that Pat Bev? specifically is gone and, oh, and Jared Vanderbilt question. too. So this could be a combination of vocal leadership, but maybe it's like, you know, 75% vocal leadership, mm-hmm. 25% sort of, you know, the way that you would lead by example with your play mm-hmm. um, rolled into one ranking. But what, what, what were your power rankings last year? Pat Bev was probably number one, right? Yeah. And we're just going to, just going off of players. Um, probably yes. Pat number one, Maybe probably probably Torian Prince two, um, D'Lo three, and then like we'll go Carl four. Um, and again, I don't think that's a, a diss at like guys like Jaden McDaniels or Jalen Noel, but I just think in the NBA or in an office setting, like it's usually not the twenty year old, twenty one year olds who are leading. Um, yeah, th- th- there are grown men in that locker room that have children or have families and stuff like that have seen a lot of things that. Guys like Ant haven't seen or, you know, Nas haven't seen. So, yeah, I think off the top of my head it would be Pat. I mean, again, a lot of guys raved about Torian Prince at the end of the season. Um, and then D'Lo, who is, you know, we've said before, like kind of sneaky underrated in terms of how much he builds those guys up and is liked. And then I would put Carl in there because I think, again, he maybe some of his stuff is deemed cheesy or, you know, self-aware by people or self-conscious. But I think the I think the big guys like hanging out with them. Um, not a lot of guys have anything bad to say about Carl, so he would come in fourth. Do you, do you have differing? Or no, like, I think I, I mean, Pat Bev is number Pat was one. number one. Yeah, I think that. I think D'Lo might have been number two. Okay, I, yep, I can't remember if you put D'Lo two or or that's Torian Prince two. And, and I don't know if I love that because I, I I think he he did a great job to his capabilities of of leading. I think he mm-hmm. is I think he has embraced that role since he's been here since the trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, Torian Prince, yes. Cat, you know, I don't think he is the leadership compass of the team, but he is the guy that will speak to the media after games more often than most players because he's the star player. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of being a front man from that perspective, he said a lot of the right things, and I think he's starting to get it more. I don't think I don't think like being a natural charismatic leader alpha type personality is something that's natural to him. Mm-hmm. So I think he does need to play off different people. I think that's his personality style. Um, I'm just trying to think like, you know, maybe you sprinkle in a little Jordan McLaughlin by example by just like doing some of the right things on the court. But I don't right. know that he would be characterized at you know whatever he was age 24 as a two way player. Um, that's I don't know that the list goes much. It wasn't like they had two or three veterans like an Andre Iguodala that never played but was like an assistant coach or something or a Udonis Haslam type. Like they didn't really have those guys to fill out their roster, right? Right, and then that's kind of why I've been making no offense to Jake Lehman, but like the Jake Lehman jokes is you just you just kind of had guys filling out that back end of the roster that yeah. had some experience, but I don't know if they were necessarily vocal leaders or had any of the. I mean, again, Austin Rivers whether you you know like his story or not he is 30 and he's been around and he's been a lottery pick and he's you know he went to duke like he's had experiences that these guys just haven't so i think that i think the dilo one's good too because i think he had five technical fouls last year which would be like a career high and not the technical fouls are a sign of leadership and two of them were in this weird miami game that he got tossed from but 
for all the stuff that you don't like about Carl on the court, D'Lo just doesn't do that stuff, right? Like, he's not really a guy you see complaining about fouls, kind of making a scene on the court. So I think that also is, you know, leading by example, like you said, something that guys like Ant and Jalen and Jaden can kind of feed off of when when things aren't going their way. They see their guy like D'Lo, and he's not complaining to the refs. Yes, that's that's actually one of my. If I could, we should do an episode at some point. If you could wave a magic wand and fix three things with the Timberwolves, <laughs> yep. well, they they kind of fix two of them: rebounding and rim protection. And the third one would be Cat leading the charge on this. Stop getting caught up in bad officiating. Yeah, you, you just you know, I used to I used to play poker for kind of a, like rent money for two or three years. And okay, I, like co-founded. Same. You can actually, see in the background. Uh, oh, there Minnesota we go. Minnesota State Poker Tour turned into the Mid-State okay. Poker Tour. Okay. Uh, poker was always a big thing in my life, uh, business and player. So you can, so we, so yep. if you played yep. poker, you can kind of speak this language too. And I had some friends who they were good players, but what really got them was the frustration of a bad beat in poker, yep. where yep. you get your money in, and maybe there is an eighty percent chance of you winning this hand. And so you're probably going to win, and you should win. Poker players love to talk about getting your money in good, right? It's like, I should be rewarded for getting my money in good. Yeah, but, like, there's still a 20 30% chance that the wrong card's going to turn. And right. it's just going to happen. Like, it is an inevitability. We talk about this on Purple Daily with football. Well, what, you know, what's he supposed to – what's Kirk Cousins supposed to do? He's getting pressure. It's like, no, defenses are paying tens of millions of dollars to 260-pound machines to specifically <laughs> disrupt your quarterback. Pressure is inevitable. Yep. Bad beats in poker are inevitable. You have to choose how you react to those things. In the NBA, two-and-a-half-hour basketball game, yep. there's going to be 10 to 15 calls that you're not in love with, and there's going to be like three to five calls that are just straight-up screwing you mm -hmm. because human beings are officiating this fast-paced game with crazy athletes making a lot of subjective gray area calls. Bad and questionable calls are an inevitability. And if you're just huffing and puffing and reacting to everything every single time while the other team goes five on four the other way, rein it in, man. So anyways, that was a major side tangent, but it's one of the biggest problems with the Timberwolves they need to fix. And it kind of is worth mentioning even more and bringing up old topics, but like at some point this season, you're going to lose your mind over Carl because I don't know if that's ever going to go away and we're going to have that podcast. But when we talked about D'Lo last week or the week before, like his whole mantra, and he's said it in post game stuff, is like never too high, never too low. So he is that poker player that like you might get rivered on mm -hmm. something that you had a ninety four percent chance to win, but if you were to interview him after that hand, he'd just kind of be like, you know, whatever. And if he was lucky enough to you know to have that six percent where on the river he got you, uh, he would also just kind of be like the same energy level. So I think to put him second back on our you know leadership power rankings is fair because there are aspects of his game we do not love, but there are things that un, like intangibles that we don't really see that I yeah. think he brings to the table. So, yeah, but to go back to like Pat was number one. So they lost their best. And you we lost both that. agree they lost their best leader. I, I think so, too. And, you know, I'm sure someone in that locker room would have like, yeah, you know, but we kind of got tired of always being yelled at or, you know, always getting it. But, um, yeah, they did. I think they lost their best leader. So now how do you replace that? Is it with one guy? Does Kyle Anderson go to the top or do you kind of patch it with like, well, now Ant's 21, he should be, you know, a 10% better leader and Carl got paid. He's here for the next seven years or whatever. Like he has to step up a little bit. I think they'll fill Pat's void as a team. I don't think there's one guy that's going to be a leader, but if it was, it'd be Kyle Anderson because he okay. played for the Spurs. He played for the Grizzlies. He's been playing for, you know, he played for Pop. That's enough said. Same with Bryn Forbes. They played for Popovich. They know what it's like to be an adult in the NBA. So give me your. So give me your. And Austin Rivers might be in this conversation. I yeah, mean, you've I think been so around too. him. So give give me your new power rankings, and I'll give you just a slight parameter here of if a game is going a little bit sideways, or if there's a key moment in a close sure. game, who is most likely to be uh, a voice of reason or a voice of strategy in a huddle or on the court? A uh, hey guys. This is what's going to happen. Hey, this is we know how to win this game. Here's what's going to happen. V vocal type leader. Well, as much as I think Austin Rivers could play a big role, I don't think the loudest guy in the huddle can be a guy who's in like street clothes or is catching DMPs, right? Like it's got to be a guy that was out there getting some of those bad whistles. So I think it'll be D'Lo. I really do. I think he'll just be quiet, but I think he'll grab those huddles. I think when you see, like you said, Phil, when two calls just don't go their way, 
I think he'll probably be the first guy to kind of huddle everyone up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also think Kyle Anderson, because again, he's been around, he's played, you know, he, he was on a young Memphis team. He's in the same role in a different place that he was last year, being a guy that comes off the bench, is expected to kind of lead that second unit. It's going to have to play everyone. Finch, Conley have referred to him as a Swiss Army knife. And I don't think that's just skills. I think that's also like his ability to be a leader on the bus, his ability to, you know, mentor Jalen Noel if he's not getting as many minutes as he thinks. So uh, I think D'Lo and, J- or, and Kyle Anderson will be the two guys that are most vocal in those huddles. But also, Torian Prince has a cool story. And those guys, again, he did a lot behind the scenes that we we never saw. But he had those guys in his room on the road talking about, you know, playing cards or talking about financials or what it's like to, you know, be married or just a lot of different things. So I think TP would kind of be another one who's maybe a little more vocal in those huddles on the sideline. Yeah. Where where do you think Rudy Gobert falls into this conversation? Oh, that's a good one. I don't know. Like, I, I just I don't think we know yet. Um, yeah. By all accounts. Because we just that- listed a bunch of players that aren't. <laughs> yeah. Rudy Gobert, Carl yeah, yeah. Anthony Towns were kind of like, yeah, yeah, and he's like kind of fourth on that list. And then Anthony Edwards mostly because of his age and yeah. just you know lack it, of experience. It could, I mean, it could be Rudy. Everyone who covered that Jazz team would take a bullet for Rudy Gobert. Like they are so sad to see him go. Um, but then you did hear, you know, Rudy had that whether, you know, everyone was immature at the time, but he had the whole touch the mic thing during COVID and stuff, but he was in his 20s still, and none of us knew what was going on. I'm not going to hold that against and him. And what but, are the odds of him actually having COVID at that time, too? You know, right, I mean, well, right. not that many people had it. Right, <laughs> so it's just like, I'm not going to paint him with that brush, but I I think, I guess that remains to be seen. It would be great, though, if he, if we looked back at this at the end of the year and based on all the interviews and the post-game stuff, like, we were like, well, you know what? We were wrong, but Rudy was number two because I don't know if he's a super vocal guy, I mean, again, he. This is just facts because he's from France. Like he speaks very good English. I don't think communication is ever a barrier. Um, and he also is going to be the guy yelling at everyone in front of him. Uh, when we talked on Mackie and Judd, and I said that he's like their free safety. Mm-hmm. He's going to be the guy that's like you saw it in Eurobasket. He was constantly talking to his teammates, yelling at them because they were not ideal defenders on the French national team. Um, so yeah, maybe it is Rudy. Maybe he's the guy that when things kind of go awry and he's got arms that are forty-two feet long. He just kind of wraps all the other four players around him and says, hey, let's reset. And then kind of, you know, maybe D'Lo kind of comes in and is like, all right, let everyone chill out. So yeah. that's a good point. I never even thought of Rudy, which is like, hey, you literally traded the entire future for him. So Yeah, it is, it, it's just such a, a weird dynamic that you've got these, the, the, the three most important players, the three best players on the team. Mm-hmm. You're, you kind of look at all of them, not as bad leaders, but just you're, you're kind of wondering, oh, are, are one of those guys going to kind of be the... Or is it going to have to be the peripheral bench role type players that, and, that step up in that regard? And, you know, listen, Anthony Edwards is not LeBron James yet. yet. Maybe he will be. Yet. But I also, too, like if you go back and just dig into like some of those first couple years LeBron was in Cleveland and who his teammates were, like a like a Larry Hughes. Um, now maybe not Jonas Ilgowskis? Yes. And, may, maybe not by LeBron's third year, but like those first couple of years, Larry Hughes just thought he was better than LeBron. So he wasn't going to let LeBron be his leader, right? Like Larry Hughes is just better than him. So I don't think that dynamic is here, but I do think it is hard for young players to lead by any other thing than just example. Like Ant can give you 40, but I don't know if Ant's going to be able to grab Torian Prince and tell him some stuff. Like TP's seen more. The age thing, I mean, think about, you know, I remember even just like in my own life, go back to my early 20s and... I made because I was just starting off in the media, and so I would hang out with other people in the media sometimes. Like yeah. all of them were way older. All like, I and, and even friends outside the media. My core group of friends when I was in my early twenties were all in their late twenties or early thirties. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a seaplane lands on my head right now here, <laughs> outside this window, and so, and you just wind up deferring a lot. It's not mm-hmm. that you don't ever have. A thought on where we should go tonight for dinner or you know that you don't yeah, ever push back sure. on them but generally when you're 21 or 23 and the company that you're around 29 32 38 you you defer more to those people than you would if it were if the ages were flipped right yeah and again i'm you know 33 but that doesn't mean that i've experienced more than everyone else that's younger than me but i just think in the league like and you just kind of said this it's Maybe you're just deferring sometimes, right? Like you're not going to always be the most outspoken person. I don't – Jaden McDaniels is never going to gather the room 
and give a Kevin O'Connor rah-rah speech. Like, it's just not going to happen. So, Kevin O'Connell, sorry. I was reading a lot of uh, KOC today because i uh, been just nerding out over, like, it's power ranking season. Oh, yeah. And, um, Damn right it is. That has to be – I hope that we never do power rankings because it's got to be, like, everyone – they do these power rankings and all the comments are are just p- people yelling at – no matter how high our lawyer team is, people are just so pissed off, so – I think for that reason, we all say that we have to do some kind of power ranking now. <laughs> okay, we, that's we, fair. we have to think of that's like fair. a creative spin on a power ranking that we that's can, fair. That we can do. Uh, we'll we'll workshop that with our <laughs> massive crew here behind the scenes at Flagrant House. Um, any just before we get to other observations and thoughts and Mighty Ducks discussion here, any other thoughts on just the leadership structure of this team now going forward? We got our power rankings. It includes D'Lo. Kyle Anderson, Torian Prince, maybe some Rudy Gobert, and hopefully some Carl Anthony Towns in there. So, you know, we'll see. it sounds so lame because every team does have a head coach, even the Boston Celtics. But like, you do want that guy who's leading the 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 on court, you know, soldiers to be someone who is good at communicating at all different levels. That was my biggest gripe with Tibbs. Is like Tibbs is clearly, you know, a Hall of Fame coach, but he had one method of communication where I think Chris Finch, and you see this in how he addresses the media or how he, you know, behind the scenes addresses some of his colleagues, I think he has a whole tool belt of communication skills. So Mm -hmm. he talks to Jaden different than he talks to Ant. Um, And I think that matters because I know we're talking about just leadership in the locker room, but the coaches are in that locker room. And I think Finch is, again, the most, I always refer to him as like the most important person in this organization I know Ant's really good and Carl's really good and Tim Connolly's a brilliant man, but Finch is going to be the thing that holds this all together. Um, and I think he might be part of the voice that fills that Pat Bev void yeah. uh, this season. I would love to uh, to consume a Tom Thibodeau leadership seminar at some point. <laughs> you know, it, would, it would just, just be... Just bellow and shout, uh, don't ever sleep, and eat only red meat for every single meal. I think a, that would be... A four-hour seminar, we're on the agenda, it just says ICE in yeah. all capital I, letters. Carl, ICE, ICE! So, With no, his, left, he, his left arm shaking for two hours as he paces the sidelines. <laughs> God. No, I, I, I think, I think Finch will be... Uh, I think Finch will be a good one. Those guys love him. That was another media day thing too. Is like, got some of the guys that signed here. It wasn't because of the weather, you know. Even though I love fall Minnesota weather, it was because they kept referencing Finch. Like Kyle Anderson was like, I wanted to play for that guy. Hmm. Um, Torian Prince too. He was an interesting interview because he had a chance to be a free agent this summer. And four or five days before, he's like, Nope, I'm not even going to dip my toes in that water. And maybe someone throws more money at me. I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to stay here because I know my role. And that's what Finch is good at is telling these guys like, hey, you might not, you're not playing tonight. They're not going to like drag him on. He's like, you're not going to play tonight, but here's the reasons why, but I can get you back in tomorrow. So they Mm -hmm. love Finch and that's going to go a long way this season for addressing chemistry because that's probably the biggest thing they don't have right now. Yeah, that is, that is uh, an amazing thing about Chris Finch is that he's seemingly able to lead with a heavy hand when needed and mm-hmm. give a guy a, a message that, or, or bench a D low yep. at the end of a playoff game or whatever it is. But then he's also able to keep all these guys. He's kind of a player's coach and also a, um, I don't know what the, he's not certainly not Tom Thibodeau in terms of getting on guys, but he can be a player's coach who gets on them and maintains their respect and gets them to do what he wants them to do, which is kind of a Holy grail of, of which, coaching, which is funny because the last three coaches have been like Tom Thibodeau, Ryan Saunders, now Chris Finch. And by my account, it's kind of like Chris Finch is just the the child of those former two yeah. coaches, right? Because Tibbs was, and again, both Meticulous Tibbs, worker yep. and, and X's and O's freak who also has a great personality and gets along with people. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was Tibbs's deficiencies were Ryan's strengths and vice versa. But mm-hmm. I kind of do think Finch has all of those strengths without any of those deficiencies. So... I'm sure there'll be little tweaks here and there with the rotation that we'll disagree with and stuff, but he's the best coach they've ever had in my mind. And they've had secretly some good coaches, Sam Mitchell, Flip Saunders, like those guys could coach. But um, Chris Finch is, again, when I say D'Lo is the straw that stirs the drink, I mean, I don't know, Finch is the glass. Like he's going to hold those guys together. Yeah. Uh, All right. What else? uh, Other thoughts and observations that stood out to you from Wolves Media Day? I want to throw it to you because, again, you were from Minnesota. Like you're, I know you're a movie buff. Like, I got into it with Austin Rivers a little bit because if, if you don't remember, Austin Rivers signed this this summer. And the first thing he did when the news broke was he tweeted, like, I've always wanted to live in Minnesota. 
um, because he was a big Muddy Ducks fan. So while well, everyone else at Media Day, by the way, is like the great Britt Robson or John Krasinski or Dane Moore, and they're asking like all these technical basketball questions, and Mike comes to me, I'm just like, hey, what, uh, what Muddy Ducks movie was your favorite? And he stared at me for the longest time, and I was like, oh, this is not going to go over well. And he truly was thinking about the answer, and his answer was the right answer. It was D2. Okay. So, so take it away. <laughs> I I love D two. D three is just kind of D three was was a little too forced for me. All yeah, much that's what like he said too. Karate Kid three kind of. It's like mm-hmm. is he still in high school? I don't even know what's happening here. He right. looks like he's forty. Um, so uh, I love D two. I love me some cheesy sports movies, and we had a nice run featuring Minnesota that we had Little Big League in the yep. early nineties and Mighty Ducks. So a lot of a lot of good uh, cheesy Minnesota sports movies there uh, in that decade. I think my biggest question about D2, how would a U.S. national team representing, I think it was the Goodwill games that they were <laughs> yep, playing yep. in in Los Angeles, uh, that we're going to take a just one team from Minnesota, a youth team from Minnesota, that, by the way, like, in the first movie was terrible until they kind they, they had some skill, but it was right. mostly just, like, chemistry and stuff. Yep. That we're going to keep that entire team intact as 80% of the U.S. national representative in this tournament. And then we're going to add like five other people, including a figure skater and another enforcer that can barely skate. <laughs> and that team is going to take on world competition, right? Yep. And then, and then why, is, uh, why is Gordon Bombay this Hollywood celebrity? Because he coached a Minnesota youth hockey team. He was... Like a borderline NHL player who coached a Minnesota youth hockey team to a certain level of success, and now he's like getting endorsements in Hollywood, and he's too like, slick back hair again. Uh, I just feel like uh, there was a couple leaps that were a bridge too far, even for <laughs> me. But I agree, it's the best movie of the Mighty Ducks movie. Yeah, and you rarely see that you know a sequel be better than the first one. But that's kind of what Austin said too. He's like the third one we got kind of weird with college and all that stuff, but yeah. um. It, it, it was cool to see a guy who, again, sometimes these media day things, I mean, go look at some of these other teams and the questions and the answers, but he seemed to literally be a 30-year-old guy who literally just wanted to geek out over the Mighty Duck. So he, I think someone had told me he went to Mall of America maybe for the first time. And if you're from <laughs> Minnesota, you, you live in the area, you're like, I cannot believe that people think this is like an attraction. Yeah. But for him, it was like, oh my God, that's where they skated around. Like, that's where, that's where Mighty Ducks were. So um, he was... He was really cool. He's really interesting. He's not going to be, again, kind of spiraling back to the leadership thing. He's not going to be a guy to hold back if this thing starts slow or they hit a speed bump. Um, he's going to tell tell it like it is. He's been around. He's played on a lot of teams. His whole story, I mean, he thought he probably was the next Kobe Bryant <laughs> coming out of college. There's a, there's a really good clip out there. If you, if you go to Twitter and you find it, it's Kevin Garnett and Tony Allen talking about Austin Rivers, when Austin Rivers, when this, uh, his dad, Doc Rivers, was coaching the Celtics, and Austin Rivers basically came to practice as like a kid and challenged Kevin Garnett to one on one. And Kevin Garnett was just like, What are you doing? And I think Austin Rivers got a shot off. And then Kevin Garnett, like, Okay, hold on, tied his laces and was like, Let me give it to this kid. But Austin Rivers has no fear. And I think that's what this team needs when you lose a guy like Pat Bev. You can't replace Pat, but Austin Rivers is damn sure going to try. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think Austin Rivers is most likely to become a mall walker of uh, of everyone. <laughs> if we had if we had the the power rankings of which Timberwolves players are most likely to do who laps in the morning that, yep. at Mall of America Sunday eight a.m. before the mall opens, who's going to be there with my dad? And it's going to be Austin Rivers. <laughs> and uh, Austin Rivers maybe maybe Bryn Forbes or something. Just yeah, Bryn, Bryn Forbes is an interesting guy too. He made like a reference to playing on a lot of talented teams at Media Day, and he kind of like. Just threw out that this team reminds me of the Milwaukee Bucks, which is like the Bucks won a championship. Mm-hmm. Bryn Forbes was a part of that. Yeah, so he's got again, some of the optimism flowing around downtown Minneapolis is not necessarily all created by me. Um, some of these other young guys or these vets that came in were like, I think this team has a lot of potential. So they see the fifty win vision just as much as you and I yeah. do. I love it. Uh, do you want to dive into the debut here of yes, Flagrant or No on Absolutely. Flagrant House? Okay. So here's how the game works. We're going to give a series of statements, and uh, you have to decide if the statement is a flagrant foul, which is way wrong, a common foul, which is, all right, it's, it's wrong, but you know, it's mm-hmm. not too far off, or not a foul, which means the statement is spot on. It's 100% correct. All right? Okay. So statement number one here, flagrant or no, 
the Timberwolves. Well, we already did this one, kind of. It's a leadership question. I'm going to skip this one. Okay. Uh, here's the next one. If Anthony Edwards explodes this season, the Timberwolves are a Western Conference Finals team. So if he takes a huge step forward this season, the Timberwolves are a Western Conference Finals team. Is that a flagrant foul, a common foul, or no, not a foul at all? I think it's a common foul in my mind, and we're just only simulating this through no injuries or whatever. But if he was like an all-star, I I would imagine you know what Carl's floor is, and I know what Rudy's floor is, and Rudy's floor is just all defense. Um, the only reason I'd call it common, which is like meh, versus no, you know, no foul, is that the West is still pretty loaded, and I think there are a couple teams like if Denver can get, you know, Michael Porter Jr. and Jamal Murray back, um, Golden State. Let's see how Phoenix uses their whole cluster down there of various narratives and storylines to see if that motivates them. Um, but if, if Ant takes a leap, I do think this team is a second, you know, round playoff team. The Western Conference Finals, again, I'm nitpicking here, but there's a couple other teams I think that would still be up there. But there's no re- there's no reason that they can't beat a Golden State or beat a Denver if Ant is John Morant this next season like we've kind of thought he should be. So I don't think this is a foul. And okay, that's fair. That's fair. I was nitpicking, but you go. I mean, you're just you're going to be the negative one on the show, and that's fine. Like, that's I'm what be, I do. I'm going to be the ray of sunshine here, which is what, <laughs> which is what I do. Uh, so here's my logic on this one. The Utah Jazz with Rudy Gobert oh, over yeah. the six previous seasons, they went to the they never went to the conference finals, but they got to the semifinals three times in six years, and then they just ran into whatever it was, you know, Clippers, small ball, or you know whatever, whatever they ran into. And uh, in the first couple trips to the Western Conference semis, it was Rudy Gobert and I believe uh, Gordon Hayward was their kind of main yep. Yep, he uh, was. like wing player slash shooting guard, right? Mm-hmm. And then Donovan Mitchell came along and, and he helped them get to the semis another year. And I look at it and say, if Ant takes a step forward, he's better than that version of Gordon Hayward. He's better than, yeah, as great as Donovan Mitchell is, he he would be better than Donovan Mitchell. I think he might be better now than Donovan Mitchell, but he, yep. if he takes a step forward, he will be definitively better than Donovan Mitchell. And they have Cat <laughs> and yeah, D'Lo right, 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 right. and all these other peripheral <laughs> pieces, right? So just by that logic, like if well, if the Jazz were able to get to the second round three times in six years and kind of run into a roadblock, if you give the Wolves these extra things with Rudy Gobert, they can break through to the Western Conference Finals. And then maybe they get slapped around by Golden State because the Warriors are just a honed dynasty or something. Right. You know? No, you know what? I actually, I, I click submit, so my vote is cast, but I probably am with you that it's <laughs> not a foul because even like, I, you know, I said Denver, I said Golden State, I said Phoenix. I didn't even include Memphis, but I think if Anthony Edwards is an all-star again and we're just knocking on knocking on wood that everyone stays healthy. Um, even the floor, like even just a, a good Carl year, not all NBA or a good Rudy year, it's just so high now that if you pair an all-star with Ant, um, and then again, like John Krasinski had a big piece yesterday on Jane McDaniels, like is he going to become an offensive threat? So mm-hmm. you're right. If Ant is the guy who is just blossoming, everything else around him is already the, the stability, the structure, all that stuff is pretty strong that even if you get the low end of, expectations from six other guys you're probably winning at least two playoff rounds so yeah, I'll, I'll give you that one it is kind of crazy that again health, health is such a factor here but you've got some known great commodities you know what rudy gobert brings to a team and the value you know what what this version of carl anthony towns brings even though i think there's even more there if you can yep. just kind of dial it in mentally sometimes and you know what d can do but these wild card spikes that are you've got these like you got the Anthony Edwards wild card spike if it mm-hmm. happens. You've got the mm-hmm. Jaden McDaniels wild card spike if it happens too. And then I think you also have there might be another level to D'Lo that you could tap into by just having these two gigantic uh, you know, target centers. Yes, if you yes, will. Yes. So again, this is like just guzzling Timberwolves Kool Aid here left and right, but there's just their their floor is so high and their ceiling is unknown. It's just such an intriguing team. And and again, I know the Kool-Aid thing. I know this is all optimistic, but a real thing, a real tangible thing is that we just talked about their depth. Um, if Jaden just – if it's not working, that's just – he's not – he ends up not being worth the the picks that you sent out to keep him. Um, you just slide Torian Prince in there or mm-hmm. Kyle Anderson 
Or, you know, if like if Jalen Noel doesn't eat in those extra minutes that Finch tries to give him, then just put Bryn Forbes in. Like yeah. you have all this depth or like, you know, if, if Rudy goes down for a handful of games, like I guess we'll just slide our all NBA center back to his normal position. And Finch has shown you that he has no problem pulling the string on a guy like he did with D'Lo in the playoffs if a guy's not playing well. He also did it, since we're not to pick on D'Lo, like he also did it with Ant back in the day when he didn't close a game with Ant because Ant just wasn't giving him enough on defense. And Ant said after the game, like, you know, I'm pissed off, but I want to be out there, but I get it. And it might have changed his trajectory as a defender. So I'm with you. I think that they just have such... The, it, it does seem like there's even things that could go wrong have safety nets to prevent mm-hmm. you from just completely bottoming out. I can tell you, uh, we've we, we've brought up Bryn Forbes like three times on this show. I'm going to be pining for him to get playing time. I am a sucker for great spot-up three-point shooters that might yeah. not have many other dimensions. Like when mm-hmm. the Timberwolves, when I was but younger, when they brought in Fred Hoiberg to play off Kevin Garnett in that starting lineup, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be... He's just going to sit in the corner and knock down like half of his threes. <laughs> Dude, Bryn, Bryn Forbes is legitimately one of the best spot up three point shooters percentage wise in the NBA. So I, I, you got to find like, I don't know, can you find a couple five minute pockets in the first half and second half for him to just launch a few threes? I'm I mean, a career forty one percent three point shooter. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you lost a lot with Malik Beasley. Um, I think Malik Beasley was probably just a little more dynamic as a shooter, but he also cost like fourteen million dollars. Bryn and had Forbes. very little basketball self awareness, or it's like, guy, we don't need you to take thirteen of them tonight. Okay, let's yeah, let's yeah, calm down I, a little bit. Yeah, and you know that might come with age or experience, but Malik Beasley was not, and nor should you be at fourteen million. But Malik Beasley was not cool going into a game and getting no shots, mm-hmm. like for twelve minutes. I don't think Bryn Forbes is going to have a problem if during his rotation he's. It just so happens that Delo's going off, or they can just get Rudy, you know, dunks at the rim every every play. So. That's another reason why I like him. But yeah, I'm, I am a sucker for that guy too. To just say, Bryn, go sit in the corner. We're going to give you, you know, six free shots a game. You got to hit three of them or, you know, two and a half of them and, and you'll be good and you'll be worth the investment. Yes. Uh, okay. Flagrant or no? Okay. But I should have brought a visual here for the YouTube audience. Uh, by the way, <laughs> click subscribe if you could and help us grow this Scorn North channel. Uh, the Timberwolves' new gray and green alternate uniforms that were unveiled are better than the old green highlighter uniforms. Is that statement a flagrant foul, a common foul, or not a foul at all? So I was at media day. I ju- not only are they putting all the players and coaches in an interview room, but there's also they're filming five thousand different things in different rooms and in the garage and all that stuff. I saw the jerseys. I thought they were actually sweet. Like I'm not. I'm not someone who buys a lot of jerseys unless they're like retro like every now and then a Mitchell and Ness but um I'm not a guy who buys a lot of jerseys so if you have kids they're far more tapped into I mean I wear the same black yoga shirts like every day from Nike so um but I thought I thought that latest edition with kind of just like the green trim and stuff was way way better those highlighter things I've never talked to someone that liked them they were such an eyesore on tv or when I was trying to stream through trashy internet on my phone so you could have literally just put potato sacks as the new statement jersey, and like the statement is, is that we're no longer have these <laughs> shitty jerseys, and I would have been happy. So I hated the neon green. I know it was statement Saturday and stuff, but I I wish that they maybe would have done them like navy and green. But again, as as someone who wears black all the time, I'm down for black jerseys with like a cool green highlighter. Yeah, you're frame. like the Steve Jobs of Timberwolves podcasters. Man. Pretty much, just yeah. Roll just makes my bed, life easier. Grab a black T-shirt and. It's will be great. productive. Well, <laughs> you can uh, you can mark this milestone. You have now met one person who did like the green highlighter oh, uniforms, God. and so I think this is a common foul. I like I really like the new ones, but I was a green highlighter guy, man. I love flat. I loved you know what when the NFL used to do the Thursday night color rush uniforms, and people hated it, and colorblind <laughs> people couldn't tell the teams apart that was in crazy. some games mm-hmm. like the jets and the bills are playing each other and fans are like colorblind fans are like i don't know who has the ball uh, i love the color rush uniforms on thursday night so i'm a big sort of wacky outside the box uniform guy but i i do enjoy these new ones that are a little, little bit more subdued they look very sharp but well, uh, i just want to stump a little bit for those of us who loved the wacky green highlighter uniforms i will require you that when we do you know a live show later this season you have to wear that the, the lime green one it will probably be in band. seattle or something people will think it's a seahawks podcast yeah, but. but i uh i don't know where you would wear that even at a bachelor party in like vegas i don't i couldn't see myself wearing a lime green just doesn't 
kind of rock with my vibe. But um, wow, I'm I'm impressed. I did not think you were gonna like those. I thought you would be anti them, but it must yeah. be the the Seahawks rubbing off. Just that it, it green color is. up there. Yeah, it probably is. Uh, I'll give you one more here, and I think okay. I know your answer as the uh, the chief Jade McDaniel's oh, yeah. officer of the uh, of the podcast here. And maybe we can do a deep dive at some point here into what exactly is his upside. But Jade McDaniels will prove he is worth the one to two additional unprotected first round picks that were sent to Utah in the Rudy Gobert deal. It's kind of they wanted, and I've heard this behind the scenes, you you probably have yep. too, that the Jazz really wanted Jaden McDaniels. And the Wolves said, How about a couple extra future picks instead? And we get to so, so he will prove that he's worth the additional unprotected picks sent to Utah in the coming years. Flagrant, common, or not a foul? Not a foul. It's that simple. It's it's we I know this is crazy and this is kind of what Krasinski wrote, but like we're talking about a guy who averages nine and four. So you would think it's at least a common so foul. That was, but that was Bill Simmons' take the day after that trade. Why are people all worked up about mm. But I will say, and this I, this was said on the Bill Simmons show, but um, Brian Windhorst of ESPN was in town when I was in town, and he went to training camp on Tuesday or whatever. And um, after kind of the the scrums departed, the first guy that he like pulled aside and talked to was Jaden McDaniels. So I don't know if he was there to write a Jaden piece, but like I think nationally too, you're starting to get a vibe of like, okay, who was that guy that is reportedly six nine, but when he walked into media on Monday was. Jaden McDaniels is definitely taller than Carl Anthony Towns. Like, he looks all of 6'11". He does look like he's put on a little weight, even though, you know, the Kevin Durant body, if it's impossible to add weight, I think Jaden has. Uh, I think he's really taken lifting seriously. Um, and I also think, too, I, I geeked out over that whole crossover 50-point game, but I think they worked on his shot a lot. I think they also want him to, like, be aggressive offensively. I know I've made jokes about how subtracting Pat and adding Rudy, you like don't have a lot of guys that can dribble, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I do think they're going to expect Jaden a little more to kind of unleash his handle. And can you, you know, even Jaden McDaniels averaging one assist a game or one and a half assists would be big because it puts pressure on the defense. And if he can get to the rim and then throw a lob to Rudy, uh, it's going to be massive. So we expect Ant to hopefully take that John Morant leap. We expect D'Lo to stir the drink, Carl and Rudy target centers, but Jaden McDaniels is the wild card. And if he were to take a leap, then I would go back to the Western Conference thing. It's like if Jaden McDaniels takes this leap where he's averaging 15 and 8, the Wolves are probably just moonwalking to the second round of the playoffs. Yeah, I, uh, it, it, is, it is not a foul. Thank I, I, I absolutely am, am on the Jaden McDaniels bandwagon too. And I love the fact that he doesn't need you to run offensive plays for mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. to make an impact. You can only have so many guys on your team where you have to you have to run stuff for them. They have to have the ball in their hands. Like he's not a he's not a high usage player in that regard. Not that he couldn't grow into more of an offensive role, but the offense that he gets is usually, you know, it's it's off of movement or it's off of you know swinging the ball around and he's open for three or something or it's grabbing offensive rebounds. So I just I am a sucker for active players that don't necessarily need the ball to have an impact. And, you know, I mean, Rudy Gobert falls into that category more than almost that. You don't think of him like that because he's such a prolific uh, defensive player and shot blocker. But, like, two of the players in the Wolves starting lineup don't really need the ball on offense. So you're not going to take away from the three guys that are efficient and good scorers, yep. hopefully. Um, but they make a huge impact in all the other areas. So complimentary, it's – he's Jay McDaniels is such a great fit for the starting five. And you know, he as Ant, he is also, you know, entering his third year, by all accounts, literally a beloved teammate. Um, he doesn't really talk much. He is a quiet guy. But I think internally, and this is this came out in John's piece a little bit, like he was like, go look at high school basketball rankings. He was the guy for a while, like mm -hmm. ahead of LaMelo, ahead of Maxi, ahead of James Wiseman, ahead of Ant in some rankings. Like when he went to Washington and stayed close to home, he was a he could have gone to Duke. He could have gone to Kentucky. Um, he stayed close to home, had a terrible year in Washington, um, and fell. But I think that guy's like, yo, I, I can, you know, if, if James Wiseman was on the, ma or if uh, Jane McDowell was on the Magic last year, he would have averaged 20 and 9. So like here's if, a question. What, what, where did he get drafted again? Uh, like, late, was late 20 first round, eight, right? 28, I think. I so, this, but 28, I think. the NBA is going to, and, and we got to bounce here in a minute, so just, we can continue yeah, this some of the time. Um, if, because the NBA is going to bring back, they're going to get rid of the, the one and done thing. Yep. Like you can just, you'll just, high school players are going to get drafted again. 
if Jaden McDaniels would have been drafted out of high school, where would he have gone in the NBA? Oh, I'd have to go back and look at the 2019 draft, but I mean, his stock probably fell by going to Washington and being a train wreck, right? Confirm, like he, he was, he would have been a, maybe a lottery pick out he, of high school. He did go 28th in the 2020 draft. He got drafted behind Leandro Balmero. Like that's something to remember. Yeah. Um, he was going higher than 28 if he would have gone out a year earlier. Like he would have. Mm-hmm. Now I can't. I have to go back and see who was in the lottery, but he's going top 20 because he's a six nine kid with a handle who. A lot of the damage he did in, at Washington was like his on the court stuff. He was kind of doing what you don't like about Cat, you know, getting technicals, falling out, doing all this stuff, kind of appearing like he's not a good teammate. And then he gets in the NBA and it's like, oh my god, that's like the sweetest kid on the roster. Yeah. Like he literally would just like walk an old lady across the street to get to Target Center. So <laughs> I uh, I do think that that's a good point. That if he would have had one year earlier to come out, he probably would have been in a different situation. Again, if Jane McDaniel's was on the Oklahoma City Thunder he'd probably get 40 shots a game. So the fact that he hasn't complained is great, but you now have shown what his worth is to you as a franchise by wanting to add extra picks and players to keep him, and now you have to invest in him and let him loose. You have to let him loose. You have to give him a longer rope if his shot's not falling. Like You have to let him play, and hopefully him and Rudy are going to be basically the best defensive duo this team has ever had. Yeah. All right. There's your flagrant howls, your, we did it. Uh, we did your, it. your weekly Wolves discussion. We are going to move to a couple days a week once the season starts as well. Love it. So we'll lock down that schedule. And you can find Kyle as well every week on Dane Moore's NBA podcast if you uh, can't get enough of Kyle's takes and theories here <laughs> wait, wait, on I'm, flagrant howls. I'm, I'm, over, I'm overexposed. Yeah, no, uh, next week when you and I talk, I think we'll be talking about basketball games because yes. they, they kick off their first preseason game on Tuesday in Miami, Thursday – in Las Vegas against the Lakers. So uh, we did it. We made it. We made Here it through we the summer. We got basketball, baby. All right. For, uh, for Kyle, I'm Phil. We'll see you guys next time here on Flagrant House. Thanks for hanging out.